Hi, my name is Thad Pulaski. I'm the Managing Director at the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes. I'm also an adjunct professor of urban planning and urban design at GSAP and um, a research scholar at the Center for Re Resilient Cities and Landscapes. And I want to introduce my colleague, colleagues, Joanna and Gerga. Do you want to introduce yourself, Joanna? Hi, everyone. I'm Joanna Lavecchio. I'm the Associate Director of the Center. And I am Gerga Basic. I'm an Associate Research Scholar at the Center. We'll share a few slides to show you a little bit about our work, and then maybe we can talk for a minute about how they get involved with us. Uh, so we have a research uh, center that we started two and a half years ago at Columbia GSAP. And let me just share my screen. Show you some slides. Uh, um, the uh, co-director of the center, the faculty director is Kate Orff. She's a, a MacArthur genius landscape architect, also the director of our urban design program and principal at SCAPE. Uh, we have started the center to bring some of the resources at Columbia University in terms of uh, research and planning and design to the ground in some of the cities and other places throughout the world that are facing a rapid transition away from what we sometimes term petrochemical urbanization. The world does not have long to transition from the land use energy industrial systems of the present to a future uh, which will um, better manage our resources. And if we do not make this transition, um, most poor and disadvantaged among us will are already suffering the worst consequences of, of climate disasters. Uh, we see resilience as a mode of empowering uh, local communities and ecosystems to survive and thrive in a, in a world that is more and more mired in crisis. You can see some of our work uh, on our website. Uh, we've been working around the world. We'll show you a few quick examples now. We've been working with the World Wildlife Fund in Mozambique which is a country that has uh, had a very tragic history, but also enjoys incredible, uh, natural, uh, incredible natural resources, uh, including mangroves and coral reefs, but also natural gas. And the government of Mozambique and our partners at the World Wildlife Fund are interested in exploring the idea of resilience and how it could help them uh, build a policy framework to manage extraction in such a way that it doesn't foreclose on uh, the growth of their natural and human capital. In other words, how they might not suffer from the resource curse. Um, so we brought students there to do a workshop with uh, a range of stakeholders from the gas companies to local environmental activists, um, local municipal government, national government. And we produced some research, this visualization by one of our research scholars builds on an understanding of how other extraction sites have uh, suffered from devastation of natural environments that has led to uh, civil unrest, to uh, disequilibrium in the economy, uh, a lot of haves and have nots, which uh, eventually leads to civil violence um, in a very disrupted landscape. Um, we built on these lessons to have a conversation um, this is about this future negative scenario and how it could be turned into a future positive scenario, one where uh, natural capital is prioritized, where uh, the investments that are made in natural gas are able to be translated into a robust and resilient diversified economy, regenerative industries, investing in local agriculture and aquaculture. We were doing this work and then tragically, um, the two cyclones uh, devastated coastal Mozambique in the spring of 2019. Uh, this is the city of Beira, which was 90% destroyed by these cyclones. Um, and we so we worked with our partners in Mozambique to bring our urban design studio back to Beira to work with UN Habitat and a local design school, uh, Uni Zambese, to envision resilient recovery for Mozambique. So we studied how uh, the recovery from this tragic cyclone was proceeding 
and how uh, we can elevate local voices in the uh, reconstruction process so that natural capital and, and the unique um, culture of the place can be preserved as they rebuild. Uh, and Joanna, I'll turn it over to you for Tel Aviv. Sure. Um, so one other issue that we've been focusing increasingly on at the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes is, um, is the issue of extreme heat um, and nested within that um, right, how the built environment not only has constructed hotter cities, but also the social vulnerabilities that make people more or less sensitive to climate risk like extreme heat um, and the direct role of urban designers and planners in constructing both of those um, phenomenon. Um, so one place where we address some of these issues is in Tel Aviv. Um, Tel Aviv is um, getting much more populous. Um, it's growing really fast, expects a lot more upward growth um, and is getting much, much hotter. Um, go to the next slide. Um, uh, we worked with them through something called the Resilience Accelerator Program where we worked directly with Tel Aviv Yafo, the municipality in Tel Aviv um, to help support their resilience strategy implementation. We worked with climate scientists here um, at Columbia, um, microclimate scientists at Tel Aviv University and then worked with the municipality as well as um, designers um, community members um, and others um, through a workshop and then sort of synthesized all of that into into a report which is on our website if you can go to the next slide um, so a little bit more about Tel Aviv um, it's getting much, much hotter um, and much drier. So we worked with the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the Center for Climate Systems Research um, here at Columbia to help prepare um, these climate projections, um, which make a pretty convincing case for some reimagined planning and design. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, it's um, also not spatially equal, right? So we looked across the city and mapped land surface temperature across Tel Aviv. Um, and if you can see in the in the bottom section of that left map, it's much, much hotter than the rest of the city. Um, and people are more sensitive, meaning we map the social factors that make people less um, capable of adapting. So things like low income, low educational attainment, large households, um, single parent households, the very old, the very young, um, and map those on top of each other. And those help point us in direction of where in the city we should focus um, efforts and engagement. If you go to the next slide. Um, so we focused in a neighborhood called Shapira, um, where it's sort of right on the precipice of gentrification pressures. And there's a lot of asylum seekers and migrants that come and settle in this neighborhood, um, very crowded housing, um, not to mention one of the hottest um, in, in Tel Aviv. So we partnered with microclimate scientists and social scientists to sort of gather some input from the community. Um, and then also um, really understand the thermodynamics of, of this neighborhood um, and the built environment's relationship to that. You can go to the next slide. Um, these are some thermal images that we took. Um, we're really interested in public space um, as sort of this key asset of all communities and the fabric of cities. So we took thermal images across um, the neighborhood to sort of illustrate the profound um, impact of materials and surfaces um, and layout of streets on heat. I'll go to the next slide. And then during the workshop, we, we thought through concepts for pilot projects um, in, in public spaces. So this is um, one of the design uh, concepts that came from the community center group. So a group of designers and academics, um, policymakers, um, and community members sat together over a three-day intensive workshop, came up with different um, regimes to increase the ventilation, use stormwater, um, increase the shading, and um, of course, think through programming to make it a more accessible, um, inclusive, um, and engaged um, space programmatically. You can go to the next slide. There's just some pictures of um, the community um, engaging with some of the work. We did some interactive mapping um, and some discussion around the design work that came through and all of which is sort of at the moment being incorporated into some of the city's design and planning actions um, and implementation now. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Gerga who's gonna talk about how some of this urban heat research is pulling forward now. Yeah, so this, the, our work in Tel Aviv uh, focused primarily on urban heat island effect and mitigation. Uh, but um, after that, we realized that, um, you know, most, most um, uh, natural hazards uh, don't come alone. They usually um, occur simultaneously or successively. Um, 
And so, um, and, and particularly uh, now we have global pandemic in the mix. So we asked ourselves the question, how do we identify most at risk communities that will bear the brunt of compound e events? Um, and, uh, so, and our hypothesis is that we can um, look at land surface temperature as a proxy for community vulnerability. And so to test this idea, we, we compared our land surface temperature maps with other historic or uh, current uh, maps of uh, vulnerability or inequality. Uh, so this is an example of LA. We see correlation of um, land surface temperature map on the left and um, redlining map uh, on the right. So the areas that are hotter have also been historically redlined. And in the next slide, we can see that those same areas are also designated as least healthy to live in in the city. Um, then in the next example, we looked at um, the Houston and the case of flooding. So the areas that are hotter in the city are also the areas that are impervious and therefore uh, prone to floods. Um, and then in, uh, in the example of um, Gauteng, South Africa, on the next slide, we looked at um, the correlation between uh, land surface temperature and vulnerability to uh, COVID-19 and saw some interesting uh, correlations there. Uh, and finally, we also looked at uh, um, the COVID-19 uh, case rate uh, here in New York City and compared that to land surface temperature maps. And I'll hand it over to Tag. Yeah, well, I'll just close by saying um, we're, we are now focusing most of our attention locally as 2020 has uh, taught us so much uh, about the need to um, focus on injustice in our own backyard. And so we've been working with local community groups to think about, uh, to participate in this conversation about remaking New York City's public realm in light of the, uh, the combined threats of climate change, global pandemic, and um, reckoning with racial injustice. Um, and so one of the ways we've been working on this is uh, with local school, um, high school students at the Wheels Academy in Washington Heights. These students have conceived a notion of turning the street in front of their school into a clean air green corridor. So our planning practicum, uh, students in the urban planning program are working with these high school students to have a conversation about how uh, building a park on this street could improve community health and co-creating an implementation plan for building this park together. Um, we went out and did field measurements of uh, using thermal cameras to understand which areas are hotter and why in the summer. Uh, we did urban design surveys and uh, cross sections. So that's a little sample of the work we've been doing, but feel free to reach out to us with questions and just quick, um, closing about how to get involved with us. As I said, we, we uh, try to combine our research or, or marry our research in some ways with, with uh, developing curriculum and climate action and resilience. Um, and that's in the urban design program and our studios and the seminars that I teach in urban planning. Um, lots of this work also involves other schools in, at Columbia and elsewhere around the world. Uh, we have events uh, where you can become part of a network of people who are both practitioners and um, community members who are focused on these issues, uh, as well as um, we sometimes have job postings. And in fact, we have one right now, which you can find on our website. Um, anything else, Gerga and Joanna, closing thoughts for prospective students? Well, thanks for your attention and um, looking forward to meeting you, hopefully in person by the time where uh, you, you come around. We have a space in Skimmerhorn and uh, so maybe we'll see you there next year. But uh, in the meantime, feel free to reach out and thanks. Bye.